It is remembered as one of the pivotal battles of the Second World War and the bloodiest in the history of the U.S. Marine Corps. For 36 days, nearly 60,000 Marines and 20,000 Japanese engaged in a merciless fight to the death for just seven and a half square miles of godforsaken rock, sand, and volcanic ash. The assault on Iwo Jima, next on Dangerous Missions. In February 1945, the remote Pacific island of Iwo Jima was being called the perfect battlefield, a killing ground of unprecedented purity. Perfect because months before the invasion, the Japanese soldiers had evacuated the native inhabitants and civilian laborers, so there was no risk of innocent bystanders getting in the way. On Iwo Jima, it was warrior against warrior, where every body and every square inch was a target. My biggest concern was that I'd run out of luck, run out of chances. How many days can you stay there and not get killed? You just have to take it as it comes. And if you're strong enough to stand it, you can stand it. If you're not strong enough, you're going to crack. If you didn't get wounded, you were going to die. That's just about the size of it. There was no getting off the island without getting hit somewhere. The battle for Iwo Jima really started months earlier on the airfields of the Marianas Islands of Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. By the end of 1944, hundreds of giant Boeing B-29 superfortresses, the state-of-the-art in strategic bombers, were taking off from these island airstrips to bomb Japan. For each 11-man aircrew, it was a grueling 15-hour, 3,000-mile round trip. Their only obstacle was Iwo Jima, a small island shaped like a pork chop about halfway to Japan. Japanese fighter planes based at the two airfields on Iwo launched attacks on the American bombers. And a radar station atop Mount Suribachi, a 550-foot volcano at the southern tip, gave the Japanese homeland two hours warning of an impending bomber attack. The Air Force wanted Iwo Jima neutralized, and it was up to the Marines to do it. Codenamed Operation Detachment, the plan to invade Iwo Jima called for two divisions, the 4th and 5th Marine Divisions, to lead the assault and land along a two-mile-long stretch of beach. The 3rd Marine Division, held in reserve, would follow up as soon as possible. Each division of 20 to 25,000 men had its own artillery, its own tanks, combat engineers, communications, and medical personnel. Collectively, this was a tough, combat-savvy landing force, as lethal and amphibious spearhead as the Marine Corps had ever fielded. On February 16th, the Navy kicked off the attack with three days of heavy bombardment. On Monday, February 19th, at 6.30 in the morning, the order was given to land the landing force and the curtain rose on the Marine Corps' greatest battle. We thought it was going to be fast, in and out, because it wasn't that big. We were three divisions against 20,000 Japanese. We thought it was going to be a cakewalk. I never saw so many ships in my life before, 
or since. They were just all over the place, all kinds of ships. Everything that you could think of was in the water and, and very visible. Now you're only one of many landing craft that are going to hit that beach. You keep going in a circle as other landing craft join you in an ever-widening circle. When that particular wave is completed, then it becomes no longer a circle, but it stretches out in a straight line. And at a given signal, that wave heads toward the beach. From my landing craft, what I seen, it was just a big mass of dust and clouds and everything like that. I said, there's no way that no one could live through all of that. This is gonna be a piece of cake. The Japanese had this supposed plan. They had all these drums of gasoline moored in the water. And when we got to certain places, they would explode this on the Amtrak's coming in. And as a consequence of that, we were issued a, a white protective screen, a, a cream that you put on your face, kind of like Super Duty uh, sun lotion. That's the way I would describe it now. And it was perfectly white. It's like white clown makeup. Pretty soon, all your buddies looked like Halloween ghouls. We had a lot of replacements from other campaigns, and this was their first time. And they were, they were hot to trot. They wanted to get in there and do their thing, you know? But the old guys, they knew it wasn't going to be easy. I was beyond being scared to go in there, but you got to go do what you got to do. They trained you to do this, and there's no way you can back out. How are you going to tell the guys you're not going to go? Everybody depends on everybody else, and you feel like you can depend on the guy on the right or on the left of you and behind you. and. Uh, you want to make very sure you do not fail them. We had never experienced this funnel assault business. See, we'd always had a jungle to work in or hills and whatnot. When we looked at what we were going into, like just you had to go right down into that cauldron and work on it. I mean, there was no other way. You're so frightened that you tend to operate as if you are someone else. You fall back on the training, the discipline that you have been going through for the last few months. That's the fuel that keeps you going in the face of your fear. I dropped the front of the ramp of the Higgins boat and there's just Marines everywhere. There's equipment everywhere, gear everywhere, scattered. It just looked like somebody had dropped a whole bunch of junk. <laughs> what I was thinking is the first and only landing I ever made in the Marine Corps, both friendly and foe, that I didn't get my feet wet. That, that just rode a wave up there and I just bounced out and I was dry. And I'm thinking, boy, I'm not even wet this time. <laughs> my first thought was, how in the world can we go through this sand? You step and go up this ramp, and you go up one step, and you go back down a half a step. And that, uh, what kind of an island is this? We talk about sand, but they weren't. They were volcanic crystals, and they didn't adhere to each other. They didn't compact or anything like that. And it was like digging in a wheat bin, you know? <laughs> you dug in it, it would just fill back up. It was like walking on BBs. And trying to run in it was impossible. It got all over you. And it was sticky, you were sweaty. Just hot and sweaty and sweating everywhere. Within 45 minutes, thousands of men, all sorts of vehicles and tons of supplies jammed the beach. The Marines were met with only sporadic small arms and artillery fire. For a short while, it looked like the invasion would indeed be a cakewalk. Then, a little after 10 a.m., the Japanese defenders opened up with all they had and turned the black sand beach into a butcher shop. Many Marines that came ashore on Iwo Jima on D-Day, February 19, 1945, expected that the island could be taken in about a week 
but their optimism abruptly vanished under an intense artillery and mortar barrage. The Marines had underestimated the Japanese defenders and their commander, General Tadamichi Korabayashi. With 30 years of distinguished service to his emperor, Kurabayashi accepted his new assignment to organize the defense of Iwo Jima in May 1944 as nothing less than a death sentence. Shortly after arriving on the island, he wrote home to his wife, do not plan for my return. For the next nine months, Kurabayashi's men dug miles of underground tunnels to link hundreds of hidden gun emplacements, caves, pillboxes, and command posts. The Japanese had turned Iwo Jima into one giant fortress. The Marines didn't know about the tunnels, and they also didn't know that Kurabayashi had told his men that it was their duty to kill 10 Marines before dying. Each Japanese soldier, he said, should think of his defense position as his graveyard. Gene Tapia was 20 years old and had never been in combat. Noise is continuous in a real battle. Noise of some type, screaming, hollering, uh, orders being flashed around, cannons going off, mortars exploding all around, rifle fire popping about your ears. But you learn quick. Get your butt down as low as you can and try to hang on to your hide. And your officer tell you, sick them, that's what you do, you go sick them. Richard Bonnet was 21 when he landed on Iwo. This was his third Pacific invasion. The mortars never quit falling. They were just coming down somewhere all the time. Sometimes real heavy, maybe they let up a little, then down they would come. The ground shook like it had an earthquake. There was so much firing going on. Truman Patterson was 18 and a mortarman. It's not a question in your mind, are you going to get a bullet? You know you are. It's just a, not a question of if, but when. Alvin Dunlap was 19 and a rifleman. The shells are firing all over. The fragments are coming from any direction. If your buddy gets killed and you don't, why, it's not your fault. It's, it's just uh, the luck of the cards or whatever. Of course, everybody, I think, feels that it's going to be the other guy. It's not going to be me. That, that drives you on, that you think, uh, OK, we're in this and so on. And, and I know I'm going to come out of it, but I'm not so sure about you. One of the thousands of Marines fighting to get off the beach was a 29-year-old gunnery sergeant named John Bassalone. His friends called him Manila John, and he was the pride of the Marine Corps. Three years earlier, in 1942, on Guadalcanal, the New Jersey native single-handedly stopped a Japanese attack with his 30 caliber machine gun. For that, he received the Medal of Honor and was ordered back to the States for a morale-boosting bond tour. Sergeant John Bassalone, I'm very happy to welcome you, the first enlisted Marine to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor, and we're very proud to have you in New York City. Can you tell us something about how you happened to get this medal? You must have mowed them down. Yes, sir, I was in a good outfit with good men. I just happened to be there, and anyone would have done the same in my place. Spoken just like a Marine. The Marines offered to make Barcelona an officer, but he refused. He wanted to rejoin his unit, and on February 19th, Gunnery Sergeant John Bassalone was back in action on Iwo Jima. For many other Marines, like Chuck Tatum, an 18-year-old machine gunner, the assault on Iwo was their first experience under enemy fire. Now everybody else, including myself, was attempting to dig the China with their hands. <laughs> And I look back, and here's a guy standing up, walking on the beach. And I'm thinking, Jesus, why didn't that? Then I realize it's Barcelona. And the people who stopped never even got to the terrace. He's kicking them. 
saying, get up, what are you gonna die on the goddamn beach? You know, get going. Chaos reigned. A Japanese field gun hidden in a bunker had pinned down the Marines. I can see the muzzle of a, a field piece shooting down the beach into the 4th Marines. And Massillon gave me the signal and I started firing at it. And of course they slammed the steel doors closed. Somewhere Bassalone found a demolition man. Bassalone ordered the Marine with a satchel of explosives to knock out the bunker and directed Tatum to lay down covering fire. Whenever the guy got to the right place, Bassalone whacked me on the head, on the helmet, to cease fire. So I quit. And this guy runs with, the, with this 10 pound charge of composition C2 and he throws it at the aperture of this field piece. Of course, 10 pounds of C2 could open up anything. <laughs> so it blew the doors off of this blockhouse. And then Bassalone gives me the signal to commence firing again. And now he's kneeling down beside me, you know. And then he sends a guy up with a flamethrower. The demolition guy with a flamethrower goes in, gives it his a couple of squirts of that deadly napalm into the aperture of the field piece. I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, I've only been here an hour, and this is really exciting, <laughs> dangerous. And uh, then Bassalone stood up a straddle of my body. I'm laying down on the sand firing, and he reaches down and he unhooks what's called the pennel hook, which leases the gun from the tripod. And he leaned over and screamed in my ear, get the belt and he grabbed the machine gun. He starts running up this area leading to this, where the, the gun housing was. And as we get to the top of this revetment or this area, the Japanese start running out of the back. And they've got this napalm all over them, on fire. And he takes the machine gun as they run out, he shoots them all. And they just fall dead. And that was our first experience in combat. <laughs> and he gave the, there's a signal, follow me. He started leading us across the island. Massalone led a charge toward the first airstrip. He ordered the men to take cover in a shell crater and hold the ground. He then headed back to the beach for reinforcements. And we look across the area that we just came across. I can see it's Massalone we can see all of a sudden a mortar shell lit among them and kill Barcelona and five other C Company Marines. So he, he was dead within the first hour and a half. America's hero. Later, Sergeant Barcelona's blood-stained haversack was found on the battlefield, a poignant reminder of every Marine's mortality. I thought, boy, nobody, <laughs> don't count on anything. Anyone's game here. You could be going a flash. By the end of the day, Marines from the 5th Division had crossed the narrow neck of the island and reached the western shore. Men of the 4th Division were fighting in the rocks and gullies along the right flank. They had succeeded in cutting off Mount Suribachi from the rest of the island. With reinforcements from the 3rd Division already on the way, the Marines consolidated their positions, dug in, and braced for a Japanese suicidal bonsai attack that they thought was sure to come. By the end of the first day of the invasion, it was clear to the Marines that taking Iwo Jima's seven and a half square miles of dirt, rock and volcanic ash was not going to be easy. On D-Day, the Marines had counted 566 of their men killed and another 1,755 wounded. As for the Japanese defenders, the Marines had no idea how many they might have killed or wounded. The well-hidden underground tunnels allowed the Japanese to strike suddenly and then disappear undetected. The Marines couldn't see their enemy, but they could hear them. That first night, 
the island never quit shaking. And I can remember hearing this rumble underneath us, like they had a dog on a train of some kind, and they, they were pushing, they were going from one end of the island to the other underneath. What they were doing, I guess, they're hauling ammo, casualties. And that's when we really realized, boy, they're down there somewhere. We found out real quick that they weren't on top of the ground. Ted Salisbury was an 18-year-old squad leader and a rifleman looking for a target. You didn't see too many of them, and you didn't see too many places where they could fire from, but they had them places pretty well camouflaged. You would just hope they didn't have you lined up in their sights, you know? Greg Emery was a 19-year-old Navy corpsman, a medic, assigned to a Marine rifle company. The rule throughout that whole battle was that night we did not move. If somebody moved above ground at night, you stood a pretty good chance of getting shot by one of your own men. We expected a bonsai charge. In fact, we got set up for it, you know, because we knew they'd, they'd done this all the times before and there'd be a bonsai charge that night. There wasn't one. They didn't do that. They'd changed their tactics. I was really relieved to wake up the next morning and find I was still alive. <laughs> At sunrise, the Marines pressed their attack on Mount Suribachi. Their heavy artillery opened fire at point-blank range on the 550-foot volcano. Amphibious trucks, called ducks, had brought the heavy guns ashore and across the soft sand. The crews unloaded the guns out in the open, exposed to Japanese snipers. Louis Torlone was a 19-year-old corporal and a gunner, part of a 10-man howitzer crew. The way we had it rigged up to do was we had an A-frame on the back of one of the ducks. And you had to back up that duck with the A-frame against the duck with the howitzer and use a three-point sling to pick the howitzer up. And then when you pick the howitzer up out of the duck, the duck pulled out from underneath the howitzer and you set the howitzer down on the ground. And all at the same time, we were getting sniper fire, machine gun fire. The 105 millimeter howitzer had a range of nearly seven miles. From their gun pits, the crews could hit just about any place on the island. The thing that impressed me was our rate of fire on our artillery. The uh, 105 howitzer manual says 105 howitzer rate of fire is three rounds a minute. One morning we fired 50 round barrage in 10 minutes. The thing we had to be real careful of as the front line moved forward was walking wounded. They would put tags on these walking wounded. Most of them were battle fatigues, and you could see them wandering around. They couldn't follow the trail back. We had to stop and go out there and lead them by hand, get them behind us. The word would come down, have each gun crew send somebody down, pick up their rations for the gun crew. I started to go down and pick up our rations, but we got a fire mission, so being a gunner, I had to stay there, and I sent David Gonzalez down to pick up the rations. He went down, picked up the rations, started back towards the gun pit, and the mortar landed almost beside of him. And time I, the guys went out and checked on him, he was already dead, so we wrapped him up in a poncho and stuck him out on the road where the ambulance jeep come by and pick up the dead. We still had the fire mission. Every time we'd fire, the concussion of the hauser made that poncho stand up, and I, I thought, sure, you know, he was trying to stand up, trying to get up, and I almost lost it there. In the midst of the battle, Alvin Dunlap, exhausted from the continuous fighting, stopped to help some forward observers spot a hidden sniper. So I borrowed the binoculars and searched the area for the sniper. And I found the, uh, the pillbox that was, was actually a machine gun that was spitting out a few rounds at a time. That's when one of those forward observers went around and, and took my picture when I was there with him. And I thought, well, that guy's taking my picture at the wrong time with my mouth open. <laughs> 
It was on the cover of Yank magazine, of Army magazine, and it's uh, calling the range. You know, I wasn't calling any range, I was yawning. They, they called it something else, but I was really yawning. I mean, that's a good sign that I wasn't getting enough sleep. <laughs> By D plus three, the Marines had encircled Mount Suribachi. Artillery, tanks, and other weapons relentlessly slammed its jagged face. On the morning of D plus four, Friday, February 23rd, the Marines prepared to climb Suribachi. A 40-man detachment from the 28th Marine Regiment, part of the 5th Marine Division, carefully snaked its way to the summit. A Marine Staff Sergeant, Lou Lowry, a photographer for Leatherneck Magazine, accompanied the patrol. They reached the rim of the crater by about 10 a.m. At 10.20, they raised a small flag, the first foreign flag ever to fly over Japanese soil. Photographer Lowry documented the moment. Private Herschel Williams was on the beach when he caught a glimpse of the Stars and Stripes. All of a sudden, people jumped up and started firing their rifles into the air and yelling and screaming and just going wild. And the boats and ships out here in the bay are firing and blowing their horns and whistles and all that sort of thing. A second larger flag was put up to replace the smaller one. A Marine combat cameraman, Sergeant Bill Janoust, captured the action on 16 millimeter Kodachrome movie film. Standing next to Janoust, a civilian still photographer working for the Associated Press named Joe Rosenthal snapped the shutter of his large format speed graphic camera. Rosenthal's picture of indomitable Marines raising the stars and stripes boosted the morale of a war-weary American public. But for the grunts fighting in the shadow of Suribachi, the sight of an American flag fluttering in the brisk breeze had a more practical meaning. It meant immediately to me that we wouldn't be shot at from both sides. This strip of land we were in, they had now had removed the menace from one side of it. I remember, especially at night, lying in my foxhole or lying in the shell hole, Mount Suribachi took on an almost human presence, like it was staring down at us, and it was a frightening a feeling. So it meant a lot to me when the flag went up and I realized Mount Suribachi is ours and it's not going to be staring down on me anymore. A lot of people believe that the flag raising signified the capture of Iwo Jima when indeed it was only the capture of Mount Suribachi. You might say the worst laid ahead of us. Of the six men, the five Marines and one Navy corpsman immortalized in Rosenthal's image, only three would survive the battle. Even Sergeant Genost, the 38-year-old Marine cameraman, would be killed nine days later while helping riflemen clear a cave on the north side of the island. The Marines had taken Suribachi, but in many ways, the assault on Iwo Jima had just begun. On February 23, 1945, while five Marines and one Navy corpsman hoisted the stars and stripes atop Iwo Jima's volcanic cone, other Marines were fighting for their lives against a tenacious enemy. Herschel Williams was a 20-year-old farm boy from Quiet Bell, West Virginia. He was a corporal, trained to operate the 70-pound M2 flamethrower. Anytime that you fired it, you always had smoke, because diesel fuel has black smoke associated with it. So anytime that you fired the weapon, you wanted to think ahead and say, well, as soon as I fire it, I'm going to move over here or over there, because it gave away where you were. So you were taught. Fire and move. Fire and move. <laughs> Find you another hole someplace. We were trying not to fire the thing all at one time. Just don't go up there and open it up and let it go because you've only got about 70 seconds of this stuff. So we were trying to fire in two and three second blasts. As the Marines moved toward the center of the island, 
William's outfit ran smack into a line of Japanese gun emplacements called pillboxes. And when we were trying to break through this reinforced line of pillboxes, we were losing men very, very rapidly. The company commander and his, what lieutenants he had left, were having a meeting. They were trying to figure out some strategy to get through those pillboxes. That's when I was asked if I thought I could do anything about those pillboxes. So I strapped on a flamethrower and started going toward the pillboxes. My lieutenant said to four other Marines, go with him and give him protection. And their job basically was, as I would try to crawl up to a pillbox, is to fire in the aperture to try to keep the Japanese from looking out or firing out of that pillbox. For four hours, Williams worked his way along the line of pillboxes, sometimes crawling within feet of the enemy emplacements. When he emptied one flamethrower, he crawled back for another and continued his fiery attack. Out around the corner of the pillbox, there came a group of Japanese. And I can remember seeing them. They, got, they have bayonets, they've got rifles, and they're coming at me with fixed bayonets. And I'm lying there on the ground just a few yards away. And I just let them have it. You know, opened up the flamethrower. And that great big ball of orange flame hit them. I can remember their movement. They were coming, charging as hard as they could charge. Then all of a sudden, they're slowing down. And they get slower. And they just fall over. And they're dead. It's a terrible stench, just terrible. Williams knocked out the seven pillboxes, and his battalion continued its advance across the island. For his bold and conspicuous gallantry, the West Virginia farm boy later received the Medal of Honor. By D plus five, 1,034 Marines had died. 3,741 were wounded, and 558 were taken out of action due to battle fatigue. But despite the heavy losses, the Marines had managed to secure Mount Suribachi and the two airfields. They had cleared the way for the Navy's construction battalions, the Seabees, to repair the runways in case any crippled B-29s needed to make an emergency landing as they returned from bombing raids over Japan. As the battle turned north, the Marines encountered a line of Japanese defenses called the Meat Grinder. Progress was slow and painful. Felton Owens was 20 and a machine gunner. We would move sometimes as little as 50 yards and we would be stopped by enemy fire. You keep going because you're supposed to. You keep going because you've been trained to. You keep going because you have your buddies on the left and on the right. Every day, you had to just gather up your courage and go because there's no way you're gonna let these guys down. There's no way you're gonna flake out on them or not go. When they say saddle up, you got ready to go. Our company went from 332 we had when we went to Evo down to 12 in the first 15 days. In one 36-hour period, we lost six different company commanders and all of our other officers. The assault on Iwo Jima was the fourth invasion for 21-year-old Mike Mervosh. When he landed, he was a platoon sergeant. When his superior officers were killed or wounded, he found himself in command. Here I was a company commander of C Company. I had a little more than 50 men. 230 of us plus landed on the island. We had roughly 50 men left. Replacements, many inexperienced men fresh out of boot camp, were brought forward to fill the depleted ranks. I didn't even get to know their names, and they became casualties. And we had something like 70, 80 replacements. I felt remorse at that time, what have you, but I felt more angry, I, angry. And I showed that to my troops, that I'm really angry, PO'd, you know what I mean? 
And uh, I want to buoy up their courage, you know, especially these replacements. The veteran fighters kept their distance from the newcomers. I didn't want any more friends. I didn't dislike them or anything, and, but uh, they came up as ammo carriers, and uh, I didn't want to know anything about their girlfriend. I didn't want to see their mother or pictures of anybody. I didn't want to lose them like you lost other people. On March 4th, D plus 13, during a rare lull in the fighting, the Marines watched a B-29 Superfortress land at airfield number one. The bomber had developed mechanical problems on a raid over Tokyo. And for the aircrew, Iwo Jima meant salvation. The bloody sacrifices made by the Marines were beginning to pay dividends. Three weeks into the assault on Iwo Jima, the 60,000 U.S. Marines had pushed what remained of General Kurabayashi's defense force into the rugged cliffs, gullies, and ravines on the northern tip of the island. By now, the outcome seemed inevitable, but the general and his loyal warriors showed no signs of surrendering. Bitter and bloody fighting continued. The only solace the Marines found on Iwo came from knowing that a corpsman was always close by. Although technically Navy personnel, corpsmen were assigned to Marine companies, and for all intents and purposes, they were Marines. Like the Army's medics, corpsmen would stop bleeding, dress wounds, apply splints, call for stretchers, and see that the wounded men reached the aid station. I've seen them crawl to help wounded people facing almost certain death. It takes some kind of bravery to go work on a wounded man and knowing that a sniper has just put him down over there and you're gonna go back right in that same situation. You're talking about bravery, now that's it. Navy Corpsman Greg Emery fought to save lives during some of the toughest battles on Iwo. You know what your duty is. You know what's expected of you. You're not going to let your buddies down. You're not going to let your Marines down. You're part of a team. All too often, the men were beyond treatment with what he carried in his medical kit. And in all those cases, all you can do is give them a few comforting words, tell them that, boy, you're lucky, it, it could have been a lot worse, but you're going to be all right. We're gonna get you out of here. That's all you can say. Be as comforting as you can. And if you have to lie to them, so you lie to them. It still rattles around in my mind where a guy would get hit and he would yell, Corbin, just a begging kind of a plea. It wasn't a command, you know, like, Corbin, come here, or that type thing. It would be a plea, come. And he'd show up. Marines reported that English-speaking Japanese soldiers would shout Corman in hopes of luring the medics into an ambush. Some frontline Marines foiled the Japanese trick by shouting a code name instead of Corman. Tulula Bankhead, I guess, was a famous Broadway singer, actress at that particular time. So they used her name to call for a corpsman because the Japanese couldn't pronounce the L's very well, apparently. And I called for the corpsman. Tulula, he came over there to where this guy is. And I said, Jesus, look. And he's looking at him, and he starts crying. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, I can't fix anybody else. I can't look at any more blood. He said, I'm through with this. I'm never going to do this again. He said, and he just, and I tried to comfort him, and he was crying, sobbing. And somebody hollered out, Tallulah. And he hears it. He jumps up and grabs his bag and runs to the next thing. Angels and dungarees. 
23 doctors and 827 corpsmen were killed on Iwo Jima. And of the 27 Medals of Honor awarded during the battle, four of the recipients were Navy corpsmen. On March 26th, D plus 35, in one last ditch attack, the remaining Japanese emerged from their caves and bunkers and rushed the airfield. In a desperate melee, the attackers were annihilated. The next day, the battle for Iwo Jima was declared over, and the exhausted Marines headed back to the beaches. They turned over the island to an Army Infantry Regiment and prepared to board waiting transport ships. We were used up. We were wrung out. There was no more left. But you give a, a day or so's rest, and it makes a lot of difference. And uh, then you, you start thanking your maker. My ship and other ships had to take some of the wounded aboard. Three of our Marines had died, and so it was necessary to bury them over the side. And that was one of the saddest moments of my life, to be there while three bodies were placed over the gunnels on boards covered with an American flag, and at the signal, the bodies slide out from under the flags and into the ocean. Taps are sounded. There's a rifle salute. There was not a man topside that morning that did not have tears in her eyes. It would be impossible not to cry. What had been assumed would be a straightforward assault turned into the most desperate and most costly battle in the history of the U.S. Marine Corps. In all, 5,885 Marines were killed and 17,272 were wounded. Why them, not me? Why them and not somebody else? Was it their turn to go? Maybe the man, man upstairs could answer it, but I can't, you know. I'm just thankful I'm here and the shape I'm in. There isn't a day goes by that I don't think of some of my boys, you know? I know their names just like it's yesterday. And, uh, I guess you never get over that. It saddens me that it was necessary to make that type of a sacrifice to preserve the freedom that others had given to us. When asked if the assault on Iwo Jima was worth it, the veterans often cite a remarkable statistic. On March 4, 1945, when the first B-29 landed in distress on Iwo, until the end of the war, more than 2,200 bombers made life-saving emergency landings on the island. That's about 24,000 airmen who would have otherwise crashed and perished at sea. Had it not been for the sacrifices and the valor of the U.S. Marines. <laughs>